Well, welcome to this video net webcast, where today we're focused on targeted TV advertising, what's in it for you and them. In the next hour, we're going to look at the different models for addressable TV advertising, but an important focus of this discussion is the model where a pay TV operator does not own or sell inventory and works in collaboration with broadcasters who do. So we're looking at how you build that win-win relationship. We'll look at business models in general, and we'll also dive into the technology of targeting, including how operators that do own inventory can plug themselves into the advertising ecosystem to attract ad budgets. We've also taken a look at how we deal with increasing volumes of IP video alongside broadcast, and how we unify the targeted advertising workflows and keep everything as efficient as possible, which be, will be an increasingly important area as we move forwards. Uh, now, we do have some resources for you today. Um, if you look on your console, you can see two application papers that you can download. They're both relevant to this discussion, so I would encourage you to do that. Uh, we will stop for audience questions as well. Uh, so if you do have a question for any of the panelists, just fire that to us. Just press the Q&A button on your console. Uh, we'll stop at least once, but hopefully twice if we have time. So let's introduce our speakers. Um, I'm delighted uh, to welcome Gert Marion, who is Innovation Manager for TV, Adverts and Digital Media at Proximus. We have Christoph Kind, who is Director Market Development for Advanced TV Advertising at MediaKind. And I'm delighted to welcome Gerald Sauvignon, who is SVP Sales for Video and Addressable TV, and he's with Smart Ad Server. So a big welcome to all of you. Good afternoon. Hello, okay, well, Christoph, you kick us off. Um, give us an overview of the targeted TV advertising market today. I mean, what are the opportunities and the use cases that you see? Thanks, John, and a very good morning or afternoon, depending on when you are in the world. But, yeah, at high level, the, the key ingredients to a successful targeted TV advertising and also linear TV advertising is about advertisers' budget uh, reaching an audience with qualified and, and first-party quality data in a premium TV inventory. Now, depending on the ownership of those two key assets being the uh, uh, first-party data audience and the premium TV inventory, do we see different use cases derived out of this uh, combination? Uh, and the first one being this use case number one, you see where a distributor have their own inventory, and that's an ecosystem that's been in place in the U.S. and in LATAM for a while, where it's been monetized already in a linear fashion, following GRP-based of approaches, pod-based, and is more and more becoming targeted uh, moving forward. Uh, use case two is about uh, broadcasters and content owners providing so-called free ad-supported TV services over the direct-to-consumer service. And indeed, do we have this use case number three, which consists in bundling uh, programmers' inventory and distributors' audience data together and attract back some of the advertising budgets, and that's indeed the, the, the use case on which we're going to be spending some time moving forward. Great stuff. All right. Well, thank you. And, and Gert, I mean, for anyone that's not familiar with Proximus, just tell us about the company. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, Proximus, we are the, basically the incumbent telecom operator in Belgium, small country in Europe, for those who don't know it. Uh, yeah, we have high quality uh, telecom networks, uh, voice, mobile, uh, DSL, fiber, 5G, um, and a lot of uh, consumer products. And one of them is our uh, TV product, which is called PIX. And it's a product that offers uh, basically pay TV uh, both to the big screen via set boxes, but also via apps on smartphones or uh, yeah, web environments. And uh, for this topic, for the conference here on uh, advertising, uh, the PIX platform is where we have launched the uh, Proximus advertising uh, product. Um, to understand a bit where, where we are situated and in what environment we are playing. So here you see a very detailed map of Belgium. Um, Belgium is a country that is typically divided in, in two parts, north and south. In the north, uh, people speak Dutch. Uh, in the south, uh, people speak French. And uh, there are four main broadcasters and linked sales houses to um, 
to those broadcasters. Here I mentioned the names of the sales houses, SBS and DPG Media, in the north and in the south, you see our DNIP. Um, we are a national operator, so we operate over the whole country uh, with our products, also advertising. Uh, the other operator in Belgium who is doing advertising, it's a cable operator who is only active in the north. Now, in the past, measurements were done on linear uh, by by SIM, where the panel there. Um, but today, we have launched addressable, and uh, there's not a measurement in place in our inherited systems. Yeah. Okay, and I mean, Proximus are one of the pioneers for addressable advertising in mainland Europe. So, I mean, Gert, can you just sort of describe the service that you launched in 2019 in a bit more detail, please? Yeah, so we have launched uh, the service, like you said, 2019. In June, we have announced it, uh, that we would offer addressable TV features on all our screens. You know, like I said, we have set boxes main screen, and uh, we have uh, apps on smartphones, tablets, and on web pages. Now, uh, yeah, this, this shows a bit what, what we are doing. Um, the color code is, it's, I'll start with that, because we launched in 2019, but before that we did a lot of trials. And our trials have started with a server-based ad insertion on smartphones, uh, where we had replay, start over, and pause live. Uh, that's the green part. That was an easy one to do, because it was all server-side, without any impact on the set boxes. Um, next, we uh, provide start over and replay on the set boxes. Uh, and the last thing that was added was live um, at insertion or at replacement, both on set boxes and uh, smartphone tablets, PC. So these are the services we are providing today. Uh, technically, uh, we are also capable to do uh, at replacement in recorded content or in on demand although that has not been launched today. Um, I just mentioned four uh, sales houses, so the four main sales houses in Belgium, and uh, they are all active and running uh, campaigns, uh, basically starting uh, January last year. So we are uh, okay. one year out. Yeah. Okay, so one year working with four sales houses already. Yes. Okay, and I mean, Gert, still, I mean, what is the role of the pay TV provider in this market? I mean, just sort of give us an idea of the value add that you bring. Yeah, the value add of, and that's and mainly approximate. Like you said, we don't own any inventory, um, but we uh, we have a lot of customers who trust us with, with their data. And that's an important part. Uh, we are capable of bringing messages to our customers really specific for their segments in a GDPR compliant manner without exposing any data to whomever, uh, in this case, the sales houses. Um, next to that, uh, we have the complete network, the complete infrastructure in place to bring high quality video to our customers. And uh, what we have added there is the ability to, in a seamless manner, replace certain ads by uh, targeted ads. Targeted ads, uh, so we have the, the stitching, uh, like it is called in technical terms, but we also have an ad decisioning uh, environment in place where um, we make sure that the data of our customers is all shielded, where uh, all the sales houses have access to book their campaigns uh, but where we can decide based on the data what will be delivered, of course, based on the campaigns with all the cappings that the sales houses provide us. Okay. And, I mean, still, I mean, you've mentioned, obviously, that you don't have inventories. I mean, how does the business model work for you in Belgium? I mean, are you you're, you're basically the enabler, the tech enabler for the, for the broadcast sales houses? That's one part. We are the tech enabler. Uh, but uh, when you look at addressable, the value chain is changing. Uh, there's a new element in there, uh, which is uh, data and, and tech enabling. Uh, so that is something we do. Uh, we don't own inventory, uh, nor do we uh, gather inventory or aggregate inventory of uh, uh, companies who do so, meaning um, 
not having inventory also means that we don't do any sales of uh, of that inventory. It's all the responsibility of the addressable ads uh, sales is all with the sales houses of the broadcaster. So they have the direct contact with the advertisers. They uh, sell uh, the campaigns, and we make sure that that they are delivered for a certain fee, of course. Next to that, uh, the broadcasters also make sure that the necessary signaling is in the video stream so that we know which inventory is available for replacement. Okay, so you are basically pioneering the model for operators with no content or inventory and no kind of share of um, sort of hours like they get in, in the USA. No, indeed, that's something we don't get. Um, so yeah, like I said, uh, our, our place in the value chain is the trusted relationship and the data we have with our customers, and next to that, the delivery network. Okay. It's complementary I mean, role. Okay, and I mean, tell us then, Ger, I mean, how do you ensure this sort of win-win relationship with the broadcasters? I mean, what are the essential principles? Well, the essential principles is that we don't uh, uh, that we don't take money away from each other. Let's say it like that. Uh, it's a new business, uh, there's a new uh, revenue opportunity here, and if we don't enable it and we don't provide our data, the broadcasters are not capable of doing any uh, addressable to our customers. Uh, so what we do is provide data, uh, provide the ad decisioning, uh, provide the delivery mechanism, and also make sure that our customers have, uh, have benefit of it, they will get uh, normally, they have more targeted advertising for them, which gives them should give them a better advertising experience. Okay, and Ger, I mean, beyond anything you've mentioned already, is there anything else that you bring to the table as an operator? Um, yeah, well, in, in Belgium, very specifically, uh, we have created uh, what is called the Belgian Data Alliance, and that's an environment where the broadcasters and the telcos come together to uh, standardize a bit the ecosystem. We are one of the founding members of that. And with standardizing the ecosystem, I mean uh, making sure that it is easy to uh, deliver the addressable adver uh, advertising. So that standardization on a technical level. Um, also, we try to have a standard in the segments we have defined, making it easy for an advertiser who wants to do addressable, he can do it uh, overall broadcasters or overall app operators to the same segment. Um, so that are things we are we are doing there also. Of course, we're not talking about uh, anything that uh, is related to business and things like that, and because, of course, that's not allowed. But technical standardization is a very important topic there. Yeah, okay. And I mean, Gert, we're showing a slide already that shows your, your ad architecture. I mean, just talk us through that in a bit more detail, exactly what's involved here. Um, all right. Uh, I hope nobody gets a nightmare of seeing this. <laughs> I, have an I, I have an engineering background and I try to make it, make it as simple as possible. So uh, let's start at the left side, uh, the pink one where the sales houses are. And, um, the sales houses, they, like I said, they sell campaigns. Um, for us, they get some forecasting uh, tools on that to see what their reach can be on our audience. When the campaign is sold, they book that campaign in our uh, ad management system. That's the Proximus ad management system. Uh, that's a free will system uh, that we are using there. And um, the broadcaster, uh, who is very close with the sales house, they start marking uh, the video. So they have to put the avails into the video stream that they deliver us, the SCUTI markers, uh, which gives spot ID uh, frame accurate times because it's very important that our customers don't get glitches in video or audio, also clash codes in break or, or in there. And that's all provided in the contribution video that we receive at our video head end. What we do there is we format the video for the distri different distribution methodologies. And first of all, I'll start with the bottom one, which is uh, towards the set-up box for the linear TV. 
um, when the set box receives the video and he sees a marker, um, he's going to ask uh, our targeted ad proxy with an ad request. Look, uh, I am user X. Uh, I have a marker here for this channel. I can replace this ad. Do you have something for me? Um, the ad uh, proxy is going to anonymize everything, send it to our ad management system, who sees all the campaigns, books for that broadcaster and for the segments, and uh, the ad management system decides, okay, show this campaign also based on capping rules, and the set of box uh, stitches it. Um, that's all uh, client side uh, insertion. For that, we also preload preload ads on the box. Now, on the other side, and that's where MediaKind uh, comes into the picture, uh, we have basically the on-demand or the point-to-point -point ABR delivery of uh, video streams. There uh, it is, but uh, Christoph is going to explain that probably a lot more in detail how it all works within MediaKind. But there also the MediaKind environment sees those uh, markers that are available, and he's going to make uh, specific manifest file for the devices, let's say streaming devices, smartphone, tablet, PC, uh, but also for the unicast uh, traffic on the set box. It's going to make specific manifest requests also based on ad decisioning by Freewheel. Um, and it's going to make sure that that inserted ad is played. Now, uh, something very important is measurement, of course. Um, we report quartiles of viewing time and things like that uh, back to uh, the ad management system. And um, linked to that, we have a reporting engine of TV Beat, which uh, via dashboard uh, can give a very detailed report on how an ad campaign has performed uh, towards the sales house. And, yeah, based on impressions, uh, we get some money for doing all those things. Great stuff. Okay, that was good to hear there's some money at the end as well. So, yeah, yeah, Christoph, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> so Christoph, um, I mean, um, teased us very nicely there to tell us about what you do. So, just give us more detail about the role uh, for MediaKind in this this targeted TV deployment. It's a great pleasure. Do you, you want to go to next slide? Yeah, it's there. Uh, yes, this one. Thanks. So yeah, we are very proud. Uh, slide. There you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we are, we are we're very proud to indeed uh, be counting uh, the Proximus team uh, as one of our uh, of our key customers in this nascent space, uh, having started this adventure already a while ago with Gert and the team, and uh, now powering uh, Proximus addressable TV advertising service with uh, Prisma for dynamic ad insertion solution. Uh, challenges were numerous, starting with. Uh, in the need to improve video ads relevance, uh, the fact that video ads were not monetized in OTT by proximus all broadcasters, and also the fact that the intimate audience relationship and knowledge proximus had with their subscribers was not monetized. Um, and MediaKind solution helped address such challenges by by helping proximus make more and more of their audience to become addressable in order to target ads on a per-user basis, uh, whether for live, uh, non-live, or near live, and across all of the IP-enabled second and first screen connected audiences. Uh, that allows to deliver a seamless TV user experience and any, any latency. And, and, and you have pre- and mid-roll server-side insertion enabled across all ABR formats, HLS, DASH, and also HSS, while Proximus uh, finalized their, their DASH migration. Um, was enabled, and um, uh, that allows obviously to remove the need to maintain multiple client applications with little to no specific development required on the receiving terminal. We also ensure viewability enablement for further ad completion rate measurement with impression tracking by conveying the tracking URL returned by uh, the tab ADS that you saw in GERF's diagram just before, 
um, as part of the add-ons uh, that we're converting into the manifest and, and conveying down to the clients. And the tracking events produced as a result of the tracking of our consumed client side, so-called client side beaconing, are then uh, returned back to Proximus uh, targeted uh, at Proxy. And, and finally, uh, did we also completely and fully integrate our, our, our Prisma DAI solution within Proximus ecosystem in terms of the ADS and audience proxy, also the uh, um, the packages, origins, CDNs, and players, which are also in in, in the mix. The result out of those uh, efforts that uh, we contributed to uh, are, are numerous. Um, we are monetizing, uh, Proximus is monetizing inserted video ads enabled with quartile viewability measurements. New inventory is enabled, uh, replay pre and mid roll, uh, agile type of insertions. Uh, new revenue streams are also generated from first and second screen, uh, fully qualified audience with first party data, and a higher value inventory is, uh, is produced for, for the broadcasters. John? Hello? I think, uh, John. Oh. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Christoph. Hi. Sorry. Yes? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I'm here, yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's sure. a lovely summary. So, so thank you. Sure. So is that is that everything you wanted to say on that slide? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so Gerald, um, you know, what do you see as the value adds that a platform operator brings to the addressable market? Uh, yes, John, so we can say that operators have a unique position uh, uh, indeed on the addressable TV market as they contribute to several key areas to make it possible for the advertising industry. Uh, on this slide, we can see that the main technical, the main technical and business components for the addressable, addressable TV, sorry, from an operator point of view, the devices, set of box and OTT, uh, several content types, linear TV, PVR, catch up, POD, different inventory source, broadcasters, on an operated uh, advertising uh, sources from the, the operator, the decision part with operator data audience segments, the broadcaster business rule for the eligibility of ad replacement and insertion. And finally, the activation with the advertisers with direct and programmatic uh, execution. Uh, in fact, we can say there are five areas where operators are highly involved. First, they have the direct relationship with, with their customers for whom they are managing the distribution and delivery of TV contents on both set box and OTT. Um, then they have also valuable de deterministic data derived from their CRM and a lot coming from us all viewing. These data are key in the targeting and decisioning processes. With new data regulation like GDPR, uh, these data are very unique, being first party data fully owned and controlled by the operator. Then when it applies, they have the responsibility to collect the user consent to allow targeted advertising for each us all, provide transparency on the data collection and the purpose of their usage. On the inventory side, they actively participate to the activation of the addressable TV inventories by implementing advertising technology on their ecosystem. According to each market rules and regulation, they syndicate the data to enable broadcasters inventory for addressable TV. This is the main case today in most countries. They act as an inventory provider for different content sources. If they, are, if they have unoperated TV channels on the OD content, for example, if they get share inventory, coming from their distribution agreement, is the case in the US and LATAM, and if they aggregate inventories from smaller broadcasters and streaming apps. Finally, at the bottom of the slide, you can see that operator execute the ad insertion or ad replacement on the request of either the broadcaster ad decisioning system or by their own ad server. Great stuff, okay. All right, so let's take some audience questions now then because we've got quite a few lining up. So I'll start with Michael McCluskey. Um, let's put this one to you, uh, Gerald. What is the impact of GDPR on targeted ads? 
what are the key considerations to ensure that the targeting is compliant? Now, I know you'll be talking about that later, so just give us a very brief answer at this point, please. Yes, yeah, so basically, uh, first, um, uh, I answer the question later, but first, uh, we, we, we know that operators are collecting consent for uh, personalization content recommendation and over services, and for specifically for advertising, uh, it, it's, it's uh, important to get the consent, uh, especially because uh, their subscriber uh, will need to uh, to get their their approval to get to be targeted with uh, with uh, using their data, and and uh, what is important is getting the consent for sure, and uh, and uh, I will explain after they, as uh, addressable TV uh, will be more and more programmatic. Uh, it, it will have to comply with the, the, the IEB uh, TCF um, uh, um, for uh, to, to share to the, the audience what what are the purpose of, of this uh, data, where they will use, and by whom. Because in the advertising environment, especially in programmatic, uh, you will have several technology provider uh, um, that will uh, get access to this data. So uh, in order to to have um, to be uh, ready and to to be able to do it, you need to do the consent uh, collection on, on your set of box. You can be also, you can use also a consent management platform uh, that will uh, provide a clear standing and, and, and message to the, to the subscriber. But uh, this is very mandatory in all countries where GDPR applies. Okay, and Ger, I've got a few questions here about the actual delivery of the content. So there's three that I'll put to you. The first one is from Herman Lockhurst at HLDPD Consultancy, and he says, are all of the live TV streams to the set-top box, including the top 10 channels unicast? And then we have uh, Devendra Mishra from Virgin Media asking similar questions. So uh, they're saying, I'm assuming that your linear TV player is on IP. And do you use manifest manipulation for ad replacement on linear TV? Can you explain how you do that? So just talk us through, you know, the actual delivery of the content, what's IP and what's not, please. Yeah, well, it's it's all IP based. Um, we have ADSL or a DSL or fiber network, so every delivery is IP based. But uh, all our linear channels are in multicast. They are delivered in IP multicast, so there's no, no manifest uh, involved in this. Uh, so it's, a, it's an MPEG transfer stream that they receive. Uh, the on-demand or the or the replay or where the, the non-live uh, linear channels, they are all in unicast. Okay, so it's IPTV multicast for linear live and um, Unicast for the on-demand. Indeed, yes. Okay. Um, another there, of course, there, quick... Sorry, carry on. No, and there, of course, there is manifest manipulation, but Christoph can explain much better than me how that is exactly done. Okay. So there's another um, question for me. Okay, and a question from Noel Nee, which I think was for you. Get. Um, who are you working with on your set-top box? <laughs> yeah, um, well, set-top boxes, uh, basically all the functional software that is on the set-top box is in-house development by Proximus. Okay, and a question so from that's, Rita. That's us, um, Sorry, carry on. No, no, that's us and some subcontractors. Okay. Uh -huh. And a question from uh, Rita Dominique at NOS. Um, now I'll put this to you as well, uh, Gert. What are the capping rules that you use in your business, i.e. how to balance customer experience and potential revenue? Um, the capping rules are under control of the sales house. So they book the campaigns. They also mark the inventory that can be replaced. And capping is up to them. Okay, great. Okay, well, let's carry on, and we'll come back to more audience questions later if we can. Uh, so let's move on with you, Christoph. And, I mean, when we look across the market as a whole, obviously IP consumption is increasing. We know that. I mean, for advertising, what are the opportunities and the challenges that that presents? Right, thanks, John. Uh, yeah, so uh, as we showed uh, first half of last year with an application pub uh, paper we published on, on that topic, 
what we end up finding is that advertising and linear rights are in fact two variables of the same equation relationship that exists between the programmers uh, and, and the distributors. Uh, to start with from a business standpoint where programmers will define the linear rights, they will award to the different distributor partners and the distributors will be in charge of of enforcing those those rights, not to forget, obviously, the advertisers who play a key role in in buying uh, uh, inventories, audiences, etc. And uh, all of these different use cases you see uh, pertain to that exact same equation uh, and translate into content insertion needs, whether it's for advertising, as we saw uh, at the beginning of this session, but also for alternate content or, or blackouts. And just to name a few, uh, being needing to support uh, a unified blackout enforcement, uh, not only at, um, at the broadcast legacy QAM level, but also uh, at the IP level, whether you are uh, out of home or in home consuming that content, uh, is uh, increasing quite dramatically the, um, the, the challenge of enforcing those rights. And so that's why uh, it seems to us that uh, IP is, uh, at the end of the day, both generating an opportunity uh, with advertising and this one-to-one -one communication that's enabled between the advertiser and a given audience, but it's also generating a challenge when it comes to enforcing linear rights and, and local regulation, as a matter of fact, uh, across all of that uh, new IP viewership. Okay. Um, and so, I mean, as we see more IP delivered content with targeting, I mean, how are we going to keep the advertising and the linear rights management workflow simple? Because that's obviously a, a key area that doesn't actually get talked very much uh, or spoken about very much. No, no that, that's right. And, and, and when it comes, uh, as we show on, on this slide, uh, what, what, what we do, what Prisma does is that when it comes to the distributor side of the equation, Prisma helps them enforce uh, advertising or alternate content insertion decisions, rules, etc., across broadcast and our IP, leveraging for that a standard I'll come back to in a minute called SCT224 or ES ESNI224, uh, leveraging that at its core to normalize all of the incoming rules into a normalized standard based format, better in format, so to speak. Okay, and Christoph, and so still with you. The business relationship we saw existing already between the programmers and the distributors is also, uh, as we will, uh, as we will see, um, uh, a technology relationship, uh, in the sense that uh, the the same technology are, uh, are are leveraged, the same technology foundations are, are leveraged and are inherited, in particular, from video and advertising standards. Okay, so Christoph, give us some more detail then on how we achieve this unified approach. Right. So, as we just saw, uh, Prisma is leveraging a set of pre-existing established video and advertising standards. Being at the core of Prisma, we avoid lock-in situation for our customers and we allow them to streamline their costs by adopting a, a single solution enabling the full set of content insertion use cases they need to enforce. Not only do we leverage these standards, but also did we develop a great level of expertise um, around, around these standards, uh, being fully integrated uh, within our customers' technology ecosystems. It's also clear that all of these standards are impacting a good part of the, of the entire audio video chain, and it's, the entire media kind portfolio is strictly following these standards as well. When it comes to more details regarding the standard and starting with uh, the SCADI 35, I mean, this is a well-known standard. Uh, it has uh, enriched uh, lately, including not only size inserts, but also time signal type of format. We won't enter into too much detail, but it's all about uh, signaling frame accurately placement opportunity in band, inside of the signal. Uh, whether the placement opportunity is for an ad break, for a program start or end, or content identification, blackout, etc. Uh, ESAM is uh, a well-known standard as well, and it's uh, the one uh, leveraged to uh, uh, provide the communication interface and enforce processing rules at the head-end level based on SCADI 35 in-band or also out-of-band time-based. And uh, on that note, I'm happy to announce that uh, MediaCan recently won an, an Emmy Award for, for this specific uh, work uh, done on, on, on ESAM. The third uh, of, of, the, of the pie is the SCT224 I just mentioned. 
And that's basically a very powerful XML data model, fully standardized that Prisma relies on, as I mentioned. Uh, and, and, and processing rules such as blackout pro pro program substitu substitution uh, are provided out of band. This is a pretty recent standard from 2015, and uh, latest release from, from 2018 uh, would be initiating the presence of advertising metadata inclusion into the this same standard, and so this is opening even further the unification of advertising and linear rights uh, at a standard level. When it comes to IIB, that's the, uh, in her the heritage from, from the advertising online world, and it's not to be introduced any longer but anymore, of course, but VAST and VMAP are typical standards that are becoming the de facto uh, standards uh, adopted by the industry. Okay, and Christoph, sticking with you, I mean, how do you actually see the targeted TV technology roadmap developing now? Because obviously the world is increasingly hybrid, you know, as we've talked about, we've got lots of broadcast as well as lots of streaming now. I mean, how far can we actually unify these workflows, do you think? Right, yeah, that's, that's in the key. And um, so I, as we showed uh, the occasion of another application paper uh, last year, uh, the server side insertion that we discussed in previous section aims at enabling dynamical insertion to the user for all IP connected devices uh, accessing TV services over ABR unicast delivery. However, there's a recognition that demand side inventory generated from mainstream consumption such as via set top box uh, connected to the TV is far more lucrative. And so, media kind sees an overall trend in broadcasters and operators to migrate the set-top boxes, as Gert just mentioned, to ABR in support of uh, all the nonlinear workflows to start with reaching the, uh, the main screen, right? And so by, by that, uh, do we uh, also capture the uh, non-live main inventory, uh, main screen inventory, sorry. And then do we have still the uh, live main screen legacy inventory activation to, to, to look into? Um, and obviously, performing main screen viewership targeting in a one to all delivery workflow, uh, such as Live IPTV, constitutes uh, an attractive inventory for the demand side, but comes with several challenges related to business, legal, and also technology matters. Um, monetization of, of such a linear inventory is readily happening, leveraging GRP as the ad currency based on TV panel data. Um, but there's been already several trials and experiments demonstrating that impression-based DAI is increasing the value through better targeting. And additionally, segments that are not part of the GRP can, uh, can be eligible for further monetization via retargeting. Um, <clears throat> obviously, there's efforts uh, required, as stated by the IAB, measurement and attribution of video marketing is an ongoing challenge facing the converged TV video space. Um, also, specific local regulation may be prohibiting addressable TV advertising on linear channel uh, and that main screen viewership. There are legal changes happening as we speak as well. But in other regions, such as the US to start with, live IPTV is an inventory that has been monetized for a while already. Um, so as, as defined by the Video Advertising Bureau, the VAB, uh, addressable TV, uh, Advertising is defined as the use of technologies to enable advertisers to selectively deliver ads to individual households via cable, satellite, set-top boxes, IPTV set-top boxes. But at the end of the day, what, what we are mainly saying is that um, performing a targeted insertion and replacement uh, narrowed down to the individual user in a one-to-all delivery workflow poses a technology challenge. There's been several experimental approaches uh, that have been uh, researched or launched in the market, which is summarized in, in the table that you see on this slide. And at high level and without entering into too many details, the, um, the, 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 there are different approaches. There is no one-size-fits-all approach, most likely. Um, but it's, uh, depending on the, on the, on the cases, uh, client side will be mandatory or going hybrid and, and preserving uh, ad request and answer, provisioning and reporting, server side may offer the advantage of unifying the entire inventory activation across all screens and all workflows. 
Okay, thank you, Christoph. So, Gerald, I mean, we talked about this just a moment ago, but um, let's just finish off this sort of area where we're talking about workflows and technology with the regulatory compliance, because obviously there's a lot of data involved. We've got the privacy sensitivities. I mean, beyond what you said in your previous answer, I mean, what do we need to think about here? Yeah, so um, uh, the question was uh, very good, and it is indeed uh, uh, we, the, the operator has to provide the, the right answer. So. As we know, instead of planning campaigns on TV programs with the grow rating point GRP as ad currency, advertisers are targeting the right audience with a specific message thanks to operators' data on a CPM cost per thousand basis. If you consider advertisers can target audience with geographic location or through specific audience segments like sports fan, low TV users, it requires the consent and must comply with regulations such as GDPR in Europe. So we know operators are already collecting consent from their subscriber for content personalization, content recommendation, and specific services. Now they are collecting consent for acceptance or refusal of personalized targeting advertising. So they must inform each user which data they are collecting, be transparent for each purpose of the data usage, meaning it's such data meant to be shared with third-party partners and who they are. We see operators uh, collecting consent uh, with a binary approach, accept all, refuse all. This is on the screen of the setup box. And some operators decide to implement the IAB, Transparency Consent Framework, which is a standard set up by the advertising industry. Uh, it was done on the initiative of the IAB Europe and the IAB Tech Lab to allow a publisher or, of course, broadcasters and operator equipped with a CMP, Consent Management Platform, to transmit to all of its partners, the purpose, so if, it, if it's targeted advertising, if it's analytics measurement, for which it has obtained the user consent. So this allows each actor in programmatic chain to ensure its compliance with the regulation on the protection of personal data. So at the end, uh, when programmatic uh, cells are involved, any subscriber, by having this uh, opportunity, to, they will, can personalize their, their choice and have a seamless consent process like in digital. But we must say that addressable advertising and TV generally has built-in privacy safeguards. Um, operators, for instance, are very careful about their user relationship. That is also that's why they are very careful when they, they are choosing their vendors. And we know that some larger digital vendors uh, build their business around the leaking of data. Uh, our analysis today is that most of current digital tech vendors are not complying fully with the European regulation, for instance. Great stuff. Okay. Well, thank you for that. And um, let's take some more audience questions now then. Um, so we have uh, Herman Lockhorst at HLPD Consultancy. He says, thanks, Gert. Because of the multicast, did you create a number of multicast streams for one and the same channel, let's say VRT, with different ads for different profiles of customers? Uh, no, no, no. That's not what we are doing. We have one multicast stream per channel. Uh, and we replace ads on an individual basis in the setup box for the linear channels. So every user gets his own ads if there is a campaign for him. And of course, if he has opted in, if he's given his consent. No multiplication of channels, no. Okay, and a question I'll put out there, I mean, Gert may be best place to to answer this one. It's from uh, Jan Frelek at digital.biz Poland. What is the profiling of the viewers? Is it based on the viewing habits or audience measurement or on the CRM data or on internet data matching or something else? Yeah, you know, it's based on, on, on the data that we can use. For, for example, internet data matching is something that you can't use uh, or geolocation in Belgium. Uh, so there are some uh, restrictions. So uh, in detail, it's view with viewing habits in their CRM data. Yeah. Okay, and I've got two questions on measurement. One from Ian Dowds, who's at UCOM, one of the uh, specification or standards bodies. Um, when you all talk measurement, I assume all the very rich data stops behind the screen. How do you know who or how many are in front of the screen and actually watching or in the room? That's a question for me also. We don't. I guess Gert, you take that one, yes. Yeah, we don't. We don't know how many people are in, 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 the, in the room. So uh, we, 
we don't uh, sell any uh, individual impression, we do it on household basis. And there has been a lot of uh, tests and uh, studies on how can you define how many people are watching the TV, but none of them has been very uh, conclusive. Um, so I think you have to be very transparent to your advertiser and say what you are selling. You are selling households, not individuals. Okay, and one final question, and Christoph, you take this one. It's from Michael McCluskey at Enghouse Systems. Uh, is there an audience size that, re that is required for targeted ads to be interesting to advertisers? What is the number of subscribers that are needed to make this approach interesting for the advertising community? More than happy to take it, but I'm sure Gert and Gerard has, uh, have a good view on uh, what's attracting the advertisers. What I do know from listening to a lot of the actors that have been working in the space is that um, it is attracting new uh, type of advertisers who didn't buy TV so far because of the budget and the size of the budget. And so uh, the, the audience size may be important, but maybe also the, the uh, how do you say, the, the precision of the audience is also key, I guess. But I'd like also to have Gert and, and Joel on that. Honestly. Yeah, Gert, do you want to add something to that quickly? Well, um, yes, the, the, precision, the precision of the audience, indeed, when you create a segment, you need to know uh, who is behind that segment to have a clear, clear definition of it, uh, what it actually means. No, there is there is a certain uh, amount of uh, people that you have to activate, and um, we saw that uh, we had to pass really the majority of our boxes to be activated to become really an uh, interesting uh, story for the for the sales house and the broadcaster. So that is that is the, the, that's important that you have um, a big number of boxes. You, with one hundred thousand boxes, I don't think that it will be. An interesting business case. Okay. Now, Gerald, we're going to talk, can, talk I, with. If you want, I can just answer. Um, uh, I think um, so. If you consider it's the, the type of advertisers and the, the, the addressable TV type of campaign. So, if you work with national or top of our TV advertisers, you will indeed need a certain reach, because uh, if, for example, addressable TV is activated every uh, to a TV campaign. Uh, for to deliver a specific message, uh, you will need a certain reach. After, if you talk to uh, local advertisers, they will they will still need some reach. But you know, they, it's uh, it's quite different to provide a, a one or two million uh, 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 set of box uh, of all for a national advertiser and uh, a few thousand for local advertisers. So that depends on the the the, the type of activation of uh, addressable TV uh, campaign. Okay, well, we're going to talk uh, about some of the demand sides now. So, Gerald, um, I mean, before we do that, I mean, we've heard about the relationship that Proximus has with the broadcaster, with the broadcasters acting as the enabler. Now, and we also know, of course, that some pay TV operators do have their own content or they have their own sales house. And so, I mean, when you look globally at the people that you talk to, what are the business models that you're seeing? And do they need different go-to-market strategies? Um, yes, we, we, we are seeing this evolution uh, over the last two years, uh, know that uh, addressable TV scaling uh, across the world. So we see the acceleration of trend for sure by operators looking to replicate the monetization business model of uh, what we call fast, free ad supported streaming uh, platforms like uh, Roku, for example, as there is a constantly growing appetite from viewers to access to a, a wide uh, variety of content. And for and for an operator, it's a way to increase their output. So this is more and more true as the data are looking to reach their targeted audience everywhere, as the TV video consumption is more and more uh, fragmented. If an advertiser uh, video has been successful in a broadcast campaign, it's smart to add over big screen premium into the mix. So by including operators inventory into the media plan, market marketers make sure the video reach uh, certain audience like cord cutters, low TV users, for example. When we talk to operators today, we see two types of situations. So operators that have contents but do not have uh, or do not want to have a sales house. And the second one is operators that have contents with a TV or, and or digital sales house 
but in both cases, addressable TV is new to them. So as the first main model for operators uh, can be a one-stop shop of premium addressable inventory in the living room for marketers. So by aggregating uh, linear TV, time-shifted, VOD across set-top box and OTT contents, and uh, by offering a wide range of targeting, so combined probabilistic data and, and, and sometimes using an AA-based model analyzing viewer profile and user viewing behaviors, they, they can enable, enable advanced user segmentation, like, for example, life moment events. So we go uh, beyond the traditional uh, targeting possibility, like uh, geo, gender, age, or family composition. So in a nutshell, they can answer, in fact, to several use cases for marketers. Obviously, geo-targeting, which accounts for to a large part of the, of the opportunity today, but they can provide an extended audience reach or increase that pressure of TV campaign as an extension uh, to the TV campaign, sorry. And they can offer affinity segments uh, through uh, tailored custom packaging, so like sports fan, lifestyles, travel enthusiasts, and they, they can reach also viewers which are not so much present on TV. Usually, uh, people that are spending no time or less than one hour per day, and uh, it's mainly younger audience uh, or, or low to use, as we say. Um, as a second business model, we see that also surfacing is model, uh, operators can become a data partner. So because they have a 360 view on history uh, of content consumption programs, be able to track when you have an ad server on your set box, you can track and measure in real time all live channels, live programs from each household, they, they can provide indeed to advertiser and agency uh, linear TV and addressable TV insight, planning and optimization. Regarding the go-to-market, um, if they have an existing sales house, they will need to extend their commercial presence with the digital or TV trading teams of media agencies, for sure. Uh, they can also get support of an external demand team, which has a daily relationship with media traders and agency buyers. This is what we do at Smart. We have a demand team that package inventory, TV video inventories, uh, with video KPI, like completion, viewability. And finally, they can use a, um, an automation selling platform to open planning and buying. Uh, we have one at Smart Buyer Connect to simplify the packaging, access, and buying to all inventories, uh, two for advertisers and media agency, and that covers uh, OTT, set-top box, uh, addressable TV, and CTV. Okay, and I mean, still with Gerald, um, now, is it realistic that the platform operator can take on a sales role for smaller broadcasters or for even for streaming app providers? I mean, streaming app providers is a particularly interesting one as more content's going through the set-top box. I mean, is that realistic? Yeah, so um, I think it's a, it's a country case by case, but uh, in Europe, for example, we think, we think it's a realistic development. And uh, today we are working to enable this opportunity in different countries. So when you think that smaller broadcasters all together can represent uh, 10 to 20% of total daily TV reach, and then if you add streaming ads, you can also reach an extra audience of 10%. So we know that smaller TV channels, uh, they don't have the resource and the money to invest in addressable TV ad tech infrastructure. And most of the time, they don't have enough reach by themselves uh, to attract advertisers. So we were talking about reach before. If you have a TV uh, a reach of TV of 0.2%, uh, you, you have audience, you can still, you, you, you are part of linear TV advertising, but for digital, it's going to be uh, difficult. So the operator indeed can provide what we call a managed service to these smaller channels. Uh, and it's based mainly on the revenue share approach. So they enable addressable TV for them, providing the technology on the ecosystem, the data management platform, and the advertising stack for campaign management, execution, and reporting. They bundle also uh, this multi-channel linear TV into an addressable TV offering uh, at the same price for this packaging, allowing to increase the reach of, of addressable TV campaigns and flexibility in the delivery between uh, GRP and addressable TV. TV comment, campaign, sorry. Uh, or the sale can also, of the inventory can be through uh, existing sales organization or through a self uh, automation platform, uh, but it's mostly in programmatic, uh, not direct sales. Okay, and then, Gerard, and, uh, if, and, if, and, yeah, sorry. And, and just to finish, sorry. And, and, and uh, I can say that it's easier for smaller broadcasters to open more addressable TV inventory we see that uh, there's in, uh, an increase of at least 15 to uh, 80 percent than uh, classical broadcasters because they have less constraints to optimize uh, GRP and CPM companies. 
Okay, and then Gerald, if, if a platform operator does have a sales function, I mean, just talk us through how you would help them open up the addressable inventory for the advertising market. Um, so, if they have, a, you mean if they have a sales function, how they do it? Yes, exactly. No? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, how, yeah, how do they uh, how do they sort of open up that inventory? Yeah, if they're doing yeah. the sales, how do they make that inventory yeah. available to the advertising market? Make yeah. that easy. Yes. So indeed. So so um, operator. Uh, when we are talking to operators in Europe, uh, uh, LATAM, APAC. So operators. We we at the end it's it's, it's a five step up five step approach. Uh, for sure, the first step we we get um, uh, talk about it uh, and Christoph, it's uh, you need to implement the proper addressable advertising technology on your ecosystem, signaling the content manage constraints and challenges such as bulk versioning, bandwidth optimization, implement dynamic and insertion technology for the ad and ad insertion and ad replacement. When it comes to the the, the commercial part, uh, first step is uh, to evaluate the ad inventory the ad opportunity uh, operator can have when they have inventory. So it's uh, first how much device, daily active device they have on set of box on OTT. Uh, what is the average time spent per household or user on OTT across all content source and during each day part? So it is calculate the reach, for example. And, um, and having that ad inventory, they will need also to uh, have this uh, uh, TV analytics or TV DMP uh, where they are uh, uh, they, do, they do data collection, um, audience segmentation, and uh, and this is where the audience segment can be uh, created with uh, each of segments have a, 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 a number of us all or OTT uh, users in that list, in, the, in this list. And after they can connect it with the ad server for the ad addressable TV ad decision. You, uh, the DMP usually is connected directly on a server side uh, basis with the ad server. The, the fourth step would be to define the industry structure also and to set up the business rules. So basically, uh, um, we know we, we advise an operator to start with a simple offer. So pre-roll, mid-roll, inventory and on, on either OTT VOD, if there are enough uh, OTT devices, or time-shifted time -shifted TV and VOD on set-top box. Uh, it's a good start to test and learn and then activate uh, addressable TV on linear when it's possible. What is important is, uh, in fact, to create the good mix between the audience reach and the content quality and the content um, that is consumed with the most interesting audience uh, segments for advertisers, because this is where um, the advertisers at the end will, uh, will require some uh, specific segments. Um, and the fifth step is uh, integrate the right advertising end to end platforms, uh, such as Smart, for example, uh, for campaign management, data activation, uh, ad decisioning, which is uh, very important in the, in, the, in, the, in the ecosystem, especially when you have uh, uh, both approach operator with inventory and broadcasters that also uh, need to uh, do addressable TV. Tracking and reporting um, for direct sales and also for programmatic, because as I said, programmatic will. Uh, Increase a lot uh, over the next uh, next two years on, on addressable TV. Uh, finally, uh, they need to connect with the advertising demand. So I will talk about that with agencies, marketers, but also uh, pure digital players because we know addressable TV also it's a, a, a way to give access uh, to um, advertisers that were not used to to, to do a TV campaign. So pure digital players, mm -hmm. and also the local and SMB advertisers, small business. Uh, because, uh, as we know, in France, for example, it's uh, half of the opportunity, and, uh, and 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 for that you need uh, you need to to manage it properly. So for operators, the the, the best option is uh, is to use also, uh, like I said, programmatic, because uh, like in digital, it secures an access to a large panel of buyers, and it's also with digital like buying process. Um, and so for addressable TV, it will be very important uh, to scale. Okay, and then just very quickly, Gerald, I mean, how do we help companies maximize the value of that addressable inventory? Yeah, so um, so I, at Smart, we are providing what we call an end-to-end -end, uh, uh, TV digital platform uh, that uh, give operators, broadcasters, content owners, CTV apps, uh, a way to manage uh, all, to, uh, all their monetization uh, type across devices. So the first thing is... Uh, for operator, the most important thing is uh, full optimization and control. So they need to have a platform that can activate all business for them and for their partners. This is why I explained, uh, being, uh, have inventory or opening uh, addressable TV on their ecosystem. 
uh, they need to have a product, uh, unified product interface to simplify the operation between addressable TV and digital workflow. Um, they, can, they have to also uh, to manage uh, different sales channel with a unique ad decisioning system to take the best decision for ad placement. So this is an important point because uh, today uh, uh, we know that um, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of partners are using a different solution uh, for different ecosystem. And and today uh, I think technology should be able uh, to provide a, a unique uh, ad decisioning system for uh, for all type of advertising. Uh, no matter if it's on set of box, on CTV, on digital. Um, and so to how we do the maximization of the addressable opportunity. So um, the ad decisioning in smart ad server is done uh, with a dedicated what we call ad, re ad call resolution engine. Mm -hmm. So uh, we fed addressable TV uh, or addressable TV system with the business rules. Mm -hmm. uh, so the business rule can be uh, the broadcaster one if it's uh, the replacement is done for the broadcasters or if it's the business rule for the operator when they, for example, want to uh, to push uh, two ads per, per, per hour on, on, on VOD content with pre-rolls. And, um, and, and also manage the, um, I, the, broadcast, the broadcast ad break constraints when, it's, uh, when they work with broadcasters. So we are able to secure, for example, the commercial model like guaranteed GPGRP for, for a broadcaster and execute position uh, ad replacement uh, in the ad break for uh, the business rules. Um, and what is important also is the scalability when you work with uh, an, an, uh, an advertising platform. Uh, today, uh, as we manage 35 billion of auction per day, uh, which is uh, which is quite important. Uh, on the demand side, um, this, we already talked about it, but uh, um, uh, this is where when I talk, operators do not have a, a sales loss or do not want to have a sales loss. They have a, a large amount of inventory the, the, the sources of content they can, they can manage. So here, uh, there are different approaches. They can, uh, like I say, work with the demand team um, that has a day-to-day -day relationship with the buyers because the, the media traders and the agency buyers are really looking for a, a, a big screen inventory. Uh, so the, this demand team can package inventory that can be surfaced and, and bought by advertisers. And uh, I already talked about this planning platform in fact, it's a direct access for traders to create their own uh, custom pack inventory across set of box, CTV, and OTT, and digital. Uh, and and, and uh, to finish here, we, we, uh, shortly we will be able to provide uh, on Rostack or, or, or DSP uh, because um, one, one, one thing that is important in addressable TV is that more and more advertisers uh, want to onboard their first party data also. And uh, to prevent data leakage, or uh, we we are we will enable our DSP uh, to protect the advertiser and the operator data uh, for for each company. Okay, and Gerald, just give us thirty seconds and only thirty seconds on why you believe interoperability is key, because I know you're you're very passionate about that. Yeah, I will do fast. So, inter so inter interoperability in digital is key, and we know it's going to be important for in addressable TV. So um, uh, uh, you have to support market-specific distributors, broadcaster interoperability specification, uh, and um, a, su a successful platform, addressable platform, is interoperable uh, to enable advertisers and broadcasters and operators, of course, to, to utilize existing third-party infrastructure such as uh, data management platform, uh, DSP, so demand side platform, SSP, ad server, and more. So um, I, I want to just give an example where a smart uh, interoperability is part of smart DNA. So uh, we make the bridge between the TV and digital by linking the TV schedule information to our ad decisioning engine, and it's done through uh, dedicated APIs for TV data and TV scheduling. Uh, we are also uh, offering um, response template that handle ad response uh, for addressable TV, ad response specificity of addressable TV with an adaptation to each operator. That's the strength of smart. It's, we adapt uh, each call to each environment. And uh, our platform is fully compliant with digital advertising standards, so IAB, TCF, I already talked about that, open measurement, VAS 4.2. And uh, to finish, is, uh, I want to say we, we, we are starting this quarter a POC with the IRPP, which is the French professional regulatory body for TV advertising. And uh, in a nutshell, we will automize the control of programmatic addressable TV creative, like uh, IRPP is doing uh, in the, for, the TV, uh, for the TV advertising. Uh, 
Um, also, we, we are working in a co-construction mode with our clients to be able to operate with any legacy system. And for example, we have developed a deep product integration with MediaKind and via Access Orca. Okay, and Ger, I mean, we talk, you mentioned earlier about the, the money being at the end of this. I mean, are your broadcaster partners attracting new money to TV because of what you're doing with them? Um, yeah, well, we are just starting with this. Huh? We are uh, one year in flight, um, and advertisers are, are, are starting to, to try addressable. First of all, we had the big advertisers. But what we see is that there are some premium brands who were before not on TV are coming to the TV domain, and also some local advertisers. Now it's all it's it's all starting for the time being. It's mainly main brands, big brands that are there. Um, for for local and a small advertiser, okay, uh, the cost might be less to uh, reach a TV audience, but you don't you can't forget that uh, TV uh, the video quality of TV uh, should be high because when you're watching something on a big screen uh, in, in high definition even 4K, it means that production of that video the quality there has to be rather high. So it's not that easy for uh, small broadcasters to come to a big video screen. You cannot show a digital campaign on a big screen. That's my personal opinion. So I think uh, one way or the other, there has to be an operational environment that facilitates that for the local small businesses. But that's so I, I call it test because it's small campaigns that are starting. They, they are happening, yeah. Okay, and I mean, Gert, you've obviously worked on this a long time now, and I mean, what would be the two main lessons that you can share with other platform operators, um, you know, who are sort of looking at doing this? Yeah, when I've been uh, when I've been hearing what Gerald has been saying, whoa, that's a very complex uh, complex uh, ecosystem and having programmatic and all those things. My first uh, advice would be start small. Uh, make sure that you have an environment where you can you do your ad decision, where you really can uh, shelter your user data. Uh, make sure that uh, if everything is GDPR compliant, that uh, your users give their consent for you to use that data. And um, when you're activating certain segments, make sure that that are segments that are demanded by the market. So speak to your advertisers, speak to your sales house. And if you're not the only one who is operating in your region, which I think will never be the case, make sure that you speak to your country leaks, uh, uh, to the other operators, because um, the more standardization you have on a technical level, uh, the bigger success the, the environment will have. In advertising, uh, operators are not competitors. Eh? Uh, if they align on technical specifications, uh, that can only grow the market. So, uh, yeah, start small, uh, keep it simple in the beginning, and uh, see how the market will grow and standardize. Okay, great. And I'm just going to finish up then by asking all three of you just to give your sort of you know, big message to, to any platform operators or broadcasters who are sort of right now just beginning to deploy or maybe sort of wondering whether they should. Uh, so, Christoph, let's start with you. All right, so well, at high level, I guess the main message uh, is that uh, technologies are available, proven, and relying on industry standards to enable the, the various identified use cases. Uh, and I guess, uh, guess uh, recommendation just now to start small and learn from the market is indeed something I can uh, easily uh, uh, follow in terms of a recommendation indeed. Uh, I mean, indeed, step by step, uh, start with one inventory, to see how the market reacts, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at high level, uh, what Prisma will enable uh, within that market will be uh, to provide a fully unified and standard-based uh, layer that will be uh, between the advertising and linear right business systems, northbound, and uh, southbound, the, the, the AV pipe. And uh, we are enforcing, Prisma is enforcing such business rules and decisions, both at the control command level and also at the processing level, whether it's on IP level or at IP level with manifest manipulation or also broadcast with TS or video-based advertising. 
Okay, and Gerald, just give us your 30 second sort of big message to people that might be doing this or just starting out. Yeah, so uh, to summarize, I think uh, all, everybody understands that we are at the beginning of a grid journey uh, and there is space for everyone. Uh, collaboration, I think it's key across the industry, um, even uh, with your competitors, because at the end, uh, uh, there, there are uh, not so many uh, operators per country, so it's very important to align and especially to make this business uh, scalable. Uh, test and learn. Uh, yeah, we we when we do POC uh, now, it's uh, it's not you know like before having POC that can last uh, one year. We can do a POC in a month because, uh, um, as Chris Cross mentioned, uh, the technology is uh, is there and it's more simple to activate. And finally, uh, yeah, choose choose your neutral advertising technology partners with no conflict of interest, and and most of all, protect your data because uh, it's a gold mine, and you have to keep its value as long as possible. Okay, and so Gert, finish us up. Same question to you. I mean, what would you say is your big message to everybody? <laughs> Everything has been said. Huh? Uh, yeah, so go for it. Technology is there. You are able to find a win-win in this new uh, value chain between you, your customers, uh, the broadcasters, the advertising world. So, uh, and, and, and something which is very important, and don't forget it, uh, Proximus never does uh, forget that, that is keep your customer in the heart of everything you're doing. Uh, make sure that there is also benefit for your customer. That's a very important one. Yes, indeed it is. Okay, well, that's the end of our webcast. So um, I just want to remind you that there are some resources that you can download, uh, the PDF application papers, so do do that. Um, this whole discussion will be on demand if you want to come back and uh, listen to any of it again, or maybe you have a colleague who would like to hear this. Um, and that just leaves me to thank our speakers. So Gert, Christophe, and Gerard, uh, thanks very much. And of course, thank you to our audience uh, for joining us. So I wish you all a very good day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.